Simon, I'm a volunteer with SCAN, and I've been asked to sort of chair this evening, so I'll take, take you through it. So, first of all, a few sort of welcomes. Welcome to Lower Shore Farm. Um, for this evening, if you've got a mobile, please remember to put it on, on silent, um, so, so we don't get those disturbances. Tonight is organised by SCAN, Swindon Climate Action Network, as part of the Swindon Liter Festival Literature. So it's, 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 it's part of that programme. The format for the evening, Chris will, will give us a talk um, for about 50 minutes, then we'll have a 10 minute break, and then we'll come back together, and Chris, um, Chris has two hats really. Um, he's a, um, a researcher, former president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. He's, he's a, quite a, a busy writer in environmental and scientific matters. He's a proper scientist. Um, but Chris is also <laughs> um, but he's also um, chair of Transition Reading. So he's also a, a community activist on transition and environmental matters. So he's one of us as well. Um, so he'll swap hats and after the, um, the the break, give us a quick ten minute primer, as it were, on what it's like running a, a transition and and what he feels would be good for us in Swindon. And so we can then go into a, a sort of question and answer session. It's a bit more sort of joining in and participative than, than most Lit Fest events. So we'll just have a sort of a question time session on that afterwards. So sort of questions at the end. And we'll bring a couple of, of local people up to sort of form a mini panel and, um, and we'll have, you know, the old TV question time type session afterwards. It always goes down really well. So that's that. Um, I've introduced Chris Rose. Delighted to see him. I've seen him speak before at Swindon Philosophy Society, um, so I'm sure we're going to have a fascinating time. And I'll, I'll hand over. All right. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's approximately what I'm uh, planning to talk about. So <laughs> which I see. Okay, universally changing climate. Why haven't I said climate change? Changing climate. Because it's not only the fact of uh, carbon in the atmosphere and so forth. The climate is changing, we're getting through most of the cheap oil, many resources, destroying the world's soil, the financial uh, system of the world is really in a terrible state. So the climate uh, is changing in all manifestations and respects. And so finally what I'm going to really bring in is where universities fit into all of this. Now, I wrote um, University Shambles um, based on my experience of really a system that was uh, and still is falling apart and has trundled off the rails con considerably. Um, rather than write anything uh, boring about it, I thought I'd have a laugh and uh, write a, a black comedy. And uh, that's essentially what we, we have over there. But there are some serious points in play that the system needs to be rejigged to be fit for purpose and certainly within the world at hand, the changing climate. And so that's really where we go. Now, this fella here, uh, we, we, we know him, don't we, Mr. Blair? I don't know where the figure came from or what analysis it was that said we needed 50% of our young people to go to university, but that was the aim. Education, education, education. And now we've got about 47% going, so the, uh, the wish has almost been fulfilled. <coughs> so half of 17 to 30-year-olds are going to university at some point. Now, he wasn't the starter of, of all of this. Of course, the man on the left-hand side we know, Harold Wilson. By the time Wilson came to power in 1964, um, there was already a wave of new universities uh, under expansion, including places like Sussex, which is where I went. And in 1966, um, a lot of the colleges of advanced technology had been awarded university status, a whole new swathe of polytechnics have been created. So really, the, the Robbins report of 63, which said, right, we need to expand our higher education to be fit as an industrial nation in competition with the rest of the world, had been fulfilled. 1992 was another rather um, significant year. Um, under John Major's watch, and this was when the binary divide between the polytechnics and the universities was abolished. And also it was the year that the research assessment exercise was introduced, which has changed completely the funding of universities. So you have one course of action that caused the expansion of the numbers of students going to university by about a factor of four, and then a second uh, wielding of the axe effectively that um, 
pushed most of the funding into the top 10 universities and the rest had to fight for, for what was left, certainly in terms of research. So I think it's instructive to look at where the universities came from in the first place. Well, we have the ancients, of course, Oxford, and then uh, some renegades uh, escaped from Oxford over a murder, I think, and they set up Cambridge a couple of centuries uh, or so after that. St Andrews, Glasgow, Dublin, uh, among the, uh, the throng of the ancient universities. The Red Bricks uh, came in the first decade of the last century, so Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, Sheffield, Birmingham and Bristol. The University of London um, is an interesting place. It was actually created in 1836 by the merger of University College and King's. Imperial College had older roots, but it formally became the Imperial College of Science in 1907. Now at the East End, Queen Mary probably has a, a more interesting history because it was thought that because of the high population and the high level of industry um, in the East End of London, that there was probably a case for a university. Now in the Mile End Road, you had something called the People's Palace. Um, it had a, a social component and it had uh, an educational component. The social component, for example, a great supporter of mine was a man called Henry Schein, who was born in Stepney. A Jew who used to uh, play cards with his father in the People's Palace, he, he used to tell me. And of course, the money for the People's Palace actually came from the local Jewish community who felt they'd done well and wanted to put something back into the area. But it was that component that held back the educational side of it to, to a large extent. They weren't taken seriously, you might say, because they weren't entirely an educational <coughs> institution. But in 1907, uh, the institution was given a three-year license to run as the East London College, part of the University of London. That worked out okay. 1910, they were given a, a five-year extension. That also worked out okay. Then in 1915, they were admitted fully and unlimitedly as a, a college of, uh, of the University of London. Good for them, basically. So the plate glass university, Sussex, where I went, York, Lancaster, Kent, and the others on the list there, they were underway from 1960. So by the time Wilson uh, came into power, um, this expansion of the universities was, was already uh, underway. <coughs> As I noted, um, the Colleges of Advanced Technology, which were created in, in the mid-50s, um, in uh, consequence of the Robbins Report in 63, they were expanded and awarded university status in, in 1966. And Brunel, Surrey, as a matter of fact, that started out um, as uh, a college, a, a cat. And the Open University um, actually started uh, its work in uh, 69, the University of the Air. And Harold Wilson was a great supporter of the OU, actually, which, uh, in my view anyway, was a, a brilliant innovation. I'm not sure it's actually done all that it, it was hoped that it would now, but because they're struggling for the same funding that all other universities are, so they're in a, a different kind of situation than they were uh, initially. So where did the polytechnics come from? Well, some of the polys can uh, trace their uh, origins back to the Mechanics Institutes of the 1920s, uh, the London Polytechnic in Regent Street, that uh, kicked off in 1838. But as noted, many, about 30, uh, were formed in the mid-60s. Um, Tony Crossland, who was Secretary of State at the time, uh, created the binary system. So you had the universities on one side that did their particular job, and the polys were created to do their job. And they focused more on what was described as high-quality vocational work, uh, mostly on engineering and applied science. But now, this was the interesting thing. Although there was a lot of snobbery against uh, the polytechnic, certainly from some people in the university sector, um, the polys actually had all their awards, from BSc right the way through to doctorate, uh, validated by the CNAA. And they used to sometimes say that actually they were validated more harshly than many of the universities who were allowed to award their own degrees. But they had to be accountable to a national body. But they had many innovations. For example, they introduced the sandwich degrees and part-time courses. Very good for people who've got jobs in industry. Um, more appropriate, you might say, for the professions, engineering, town planning, law, architecture, and training science technicians. And there was far less uh, emphasis on research. And much of the research that went on in the polytechnics tended to be uh, tied in with local industry and often funded by local industry. And that, in my view, was the great strength of the polytechnics that they provided locally, they interacted with local industry and provided, if you like, for the local or the town community, whereas the university had its own job, 
not the same thing at all. They were never intended to be. So moving on through this uh, sort of historical um, litany, um, in the 1970s, as we are well aware, most of us who, who were there at the time, um, there was considerable industrial strife for all, all sorts of reasons. I'm not a politician, I'm not being political, I'm simply recording the, uh, the elements of the time in uh, reference to the general subject. So the miners uh, went on strike, the, the miners went on strike a few times and they had pretty good reasons for doing so, but there were definite consequences to the country because of this. 1975, do you, do you recall the history? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. It was uh, made into a, a drama, wasn't it, around 1980 and broadcast on television? Yeah, that was Malcolm Bradbury. He um, established the um, School of Creative Writing at the University of East Anglia in, in 67. And he wrote The History Man, which was his kind of, um, well, lampooning take um, vial of vitriol, you might say, at the, the university system, basically of the 1960s. You might say my uh, novel is a vial of vitriol at the university system in the 1990s and beyond. However, there you go. Very good, very good story. I think very accurate to uh, certainly how I remember universities in terms of the, the politicians, <coughs> the politics, the egos, um, all the rest of the things that go on in, in university minds and university you know, cloisters and corridors. So by the end of the 70s, um, Britain was in a, a bit of a state, to put it mildly. This is a pile of rubbish in Leicester Square. Amazing, isn't it? Uh, it you look at that. And this was not um, a solitary example. Uh, there, there were many problems like this, many features like this, because everybody was on strike. Uh, the rubbish wasn't uh, being, bur being uh, buried, neither were the, the bodies, actually, as a matter of fact. So the rubbish piled up in the streets. The, the grave diggers went on strike. So the bodies went unburied and were kept in refrigerated meat lorries. Um, in Liverpool, the council hired a warehouse to store coffins as their grave diggers went on strike. Amazing that. And they seriously considered burial at sea to, to get rid of the bodies at the time. It was such a problem. Obviously, you don't want bodies hanging around for too long. It becomes a bit of a, a health hazard. Hospitals turned away patients, regular power cuts. Um, inflation was running at 27%. Imagine that. And so, of course, the public sector workers wanted pay to actually match that amount because otherwise they're getting poorer all the time. So by the end of all this, Labour had pretty much lost all its credibility. And then the Conservatives were swept to power uh, with a majority of 70 over Labour um, in 1979. And, of course, we know what happens next, don't we? She seemed to play the role. And I will give her this. I mean, whatever you people may think of Margaret Thatcher, to get where she did as a woman in that uh, time, I mean, it, it is no mean uh, feat. So she had to be bloody tough, really. Um, I certainly didn't agree with her policies at the time, but it, it's a, a sympathetic portrait of a person, you might say, sort of disregarding the, the politics. So uh, the Conservatives came in with uh, Margaret Thatcher as their, their leader. The consequence was what? Massive unemployment, uh, three million ensued because the manufacturing industry collapsed. Those industries that were deemed to be unprofitable, like coal mining, steel, the, the subsidies were withdrawn. And basically, uh, people just started to, to go on the dole. 1980, I remember this very well because my brother um, was apprenticed as an electrician with the, the GPO in 1980. Aged 18, within three months, they scrapped the scheme. So it was on the scrappy. I mean, why did they scrap the apprenticeships? God knows, because now the government seems to have seen sense and they want them back again. They should never have got rid of them in the first place. Worst of all, uh, I think, was the creation of the benefits culture, because to massage down the unemployment figures, they took two and a half million people altogether over the 1980s, took them off the unemployment register, and put them uh, on invalidity benefit, on the sick which is putting people into a box from which there's no ready escape. There was no mechanism. It was just a massage down the figures. So you put people um, really in a, in a trap, um, two or three generations down the line. I think we, we are seeing people who have suffered uh, from this. 1981, the first round of university cuts. Again, I've never quite understood this. Um, a leader who is keen on the industrial power nation, why would you cut the technological universities first? I don't know. 
But Salford, Bradford, Aston and Brunel each, each lost more than a third of their funding in one go. They survived by going out to industry and getting the money in. Again, that was um, to their credit. But that was just the start. This rationalisation process would continue. And so now we have uh, another figure. Here he is, uh, Keith Joseph. He was the Secretary of State for Education and Science. Hey? We were just saying what an awful photograph. I said, yes, that's when he was quite ill, obviously. Yeah, okay. Because he was quite ill by, by the end. Yeah, he was, he was. I imagine uh, whatever one may think of him, the job must have taken its toll on him too. Mm. Can't be easy. And we can slag off the politicians, but I wouldn't want their job particularly. You know, not, not personally, some people might, but I wouldn't. But he was the driver of Thatcherism. Uh, basically, he originated the GCSE. And he was given, well, he was basically given the job of hatchet man. And he was given the idea, of, or the, the job of rationalizing, uh, rationalizing the universities, which is a bit like uh, the rationalizing of the monasteries, I imagine, back in the <laughs> history. <laughs> so, something like this. But anyway, he was told to, well, basically save money. So in 1986, this was the first, the research selectivity exercise. This is the forerunner of the research assessment exercise. Anyway, there he is, he's speaking um, in the house, and he says, I should like to uh, say the following about university funding. Uh, right, the, the details will be conveyed to the University Grants uh, Commission, and in plain language they mean more funds for the better research departments, less for the, the less good. As some departments gain, others may have to be reduced or even closed. The universities will have perhaps every opportunity, well, in other words, whatever we give you, you will have to do the best with it, because that's all you're going to get. And so either you're innovative and you make the best and you keep going, or we'll close you down, possibly. Now the university system at that time uh, cost about three billion pounds a year. So it was ripe for reform, because the country was not in a good uh, economic state. Um, I mean, Margaret Thatcher was saying, well, if we don't implement these policies, we shall go bankrupt. Uh, even at that time. Now, science departments are very expensive to run, and having many small departments, even more so because of the equipment. Let me try and explain that. Um, if you've got, for example, a chemistry department, even if you, for example, only had 10 staff and 100 students, there's still a certain amount of kit you need. You need a nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer, you need mass spectrometry, you need about a million's worth of equipment just to do the job at all. And with that same amount of equipment, you could run a department that's maybe two or three times the size, but you need this basic amount. So, of course, a small science department um, is a vice-chancellor's nightmare because it's costing the university an absolute fortune, whereas a bigger one um, is likely to be more cost-effective. This was the thinking. And it was reckoned at that time that to be viable, the department had to have at least 20 academic staff and 200 full-time equivalent students. That was before they were customers. Um, but this launched what I, I would um, legitimately call a cull of many of the smaller uh, departments. And, and yeah, chemistry and physics particularly, because they're the expensive ones. So Royal Holloway College, Brunel, Goldsmiths, um, Cass, that was out, out in the East End, Sir John Cass College, um, Queen Elizabeth College, Westfield. Queen Elizabeth um, merged with Kings, Westfield merged with Queen Mary out in the East End. Um, Cass, that became part of what is now London Metropolitan University by a, a complex route. Um, Goldsmiths, uh, the chemistry department merged with Thames Poly, I think it was. Anyway, all these things happened. But it's true that now um, many universities no longer have any core science program. They don't have a chemistry or a physics department. And, Having uh, initiated this rationalisation, then Margaret Thatcher said, can an institution that has neither a physics nor a chemistry department be called a university? Um, I, in my guts, I would say probably not, actually. But then universities have changed their character in, in many ways. And core science is not necessarily something that all universities do these days. They do other things, as we shall see. So 1992, it's a bit like 1984, doesn't it, in, in terms of its um, effect on uh, society. It was momentous for two reasons, as I know. Um, one, the binary divide between the polytechnics and the universities was abolished. 
And as I said, secondly, the format, at least in the, the later research assessment exercise, was introduced. Now, the effect um, of these two um, operations combined with the bums on seats funding. So, in other words, I mean, no university is going to want to suddenly take four times as many students because it's going to be a right hassle, it's going to be very difficult, you're going to have to sort of double or triple every bit of teaching loads. But they said, well, you get funded according to how many students you've got. So you've got to take that number or you have to start uh, laying off the staff effectively. And now, as I say, um, it's 47% of 17 to 30 year olds um, now have some uh, experience of going to university. So that's an expansion by nearly 400%. When I went to university, which is quite a few years ago now, it was about 12%. I thought that was 18 to 19 year olds. But it also created a bottom layer in a total league of now 116 universities, while the effect of the RAE uh, pushed most of the funding into the top 10. And prior to 1989, the polys had their own funding because they were part of the local authorities. Then you had an interstitial period where there was polytechnics and colleges funding council, and then once they were awarded university status, they all went under the umbrella of funding by the uh, uh, HEFC, Higher Education Funding Council for England, wasn't it? Yeah. So they were all in the same boat then, but uh, of course with a polarisation um, up and down the lead of how much funding they got. So what was the real reason for relabeling the polys at un as universities? Inclusiveness? Well, not entirely. Um, as we've seen, we had a collapse of the old manufacturing industry in the 1980s, and with the recession also, this uh, meant that there'd be record numbers of, of young people, 18 to 24-year-olds, unemployed. Now, no government wants that, certainly not if they want to get re-elected. But equally, because the nation had lost so much of its industry, the polytechnics had effectively lost their job. So what to do? A solution, uh, which very much is in inverted commas as far as I'm concerned, is to rename the polytechnics as universities and then expand the, the intake by a factor of four. But you force them to take the extra numbers of students by the bums on seats funding policy. And so you keep vast numbers of young people off the unemployment figures because they're in education and training. So again, it's a massaging of figures, but again with severe um, social consequences. This is, um, it, it gets a bit complicated up the other end because they've changed the way they actually um, calculate how many people are going to university. But we see pretty much that going back to 1950, just over 3% of 18 and 19 year olds went to university. And it was university mostly, because there weren't very many polytechnics then. Then you see the, the expansion over time through the 60s and up to about uh, 1970. And it sort of puddled along for a while, a bit of a drop uh, in the late 70s. And then in the run up to uh, the polys being uh, made into universities, then you see this huge ramping up of the numbers going. And, as I say, the, the final figure, looking at the Office for National Statistics website, is about 47%. So, uh, Tony Blair's uh, wish is practically fulfilled by now. Now, this is an interesting point. Uh, people talk a lot about standards in universities. This is uh, an article in the Times Higher Ed by a man called Ken Stout, about five years after they abolished the binary divide and made everywhere a university. He was, as I recall, a professor of engineering at Huddersfield University. And he was basically making the point that, um, well, a lot of the uh, people who are called professor something <coughs> are crap, effectively, and they don't really have any academic uh, credentials whatsoever. And he was saying that, uh, he was explaining it in this way, during the period when the former polytechnics were aspiring to become universities, they began to appoint their own professors. Well, he doesn't mince his words. The outcome was a rash of professors which pockmark their establishments. Unless there is remedial action, the human leprosy will meander on. The, the problem, I mean, he, he feels quite strongly about this, obviously. Yeah. The problem is not confined to the new universities, i.e. the ex-polys, but is spread across the system. And it is true that in many universities, usually the former polytechnics, you have many professors with practically no published work. They get it for course administration, for all sorts of things that don't involve any um, independent intellectual contribution to their subject. They get it for being a manager, for being head of department. 
But it's not like a block title. You get people walking around the professor of evolutionary biology. I mean, he might as well be professor of medieval history for all the credibility. But it's laughable. The standards have gone out of the window in a lot of places. So could you explain what a professor is supposed to be? A what professor is supposed to be somebody with an international reputation in this subject, which is normally demonstrated by published work. Um, they're the sort of person you invite to your major conference because they are an expert on, on some particular field. Okay? And many people who are professors, something or other, are not any of these things. Right. In some subjects, pharmacy practice comes to mind. The only way you can get somebody <coughs> from the private sector to take a job in a university and teach a pharmacy course is to award them a professorship, because that's the only way you can match the salary, irrespective of, of academic quality. And that's not only in, in the, the ex-polytechnics. I mean, I can think of an example of a very good university in Reading where, where this is the case. But it's, uh, it's very strange. It's also to do with commercialization of the universities and education. Too many managers. Yeah, the, the culture of, of generic uh, management. Generic management is the idea, in my mind, that you can run a, if you're a manager, you can run a university the same as you can run a bus company or London Zoo. You don't actually seem to have to have any experience of the, uh, the organization that, that you're managing. You often find it's unsuccessful academics become senior administrators and they rise up through the ranks. And because the polytechnics belong to the local authorities, they did have this bureaucracy associated with them. I mean, anybody would, would agree with that. And this seems to have infected the entire system. There's a woman called Amanda Goodall. She's a professor at um, Warwick University. Nice woman, actually. She's written a fairly heavy-duty book called Socrates and the Boardroom. And she's focusing on places like Princeton, and she's making some strong point that they are successful because they're run <coughs> by, uh, as she says, top scholars, not by people in suits, not by managers. They're run by people who actually know the game. Um, the rise of teaching only academics. Yeah, as a personal example, um, I worked in an institution that was uh, called Thames Polytechnic for a year, and it's now called the University of Greenwich. And I was working there um, because there weren't any university lectureships. I wanted a university job because I wanted to do my own research. Anyway, I got a lectureship at Queen Mary College in organic chemistry. And the head of the department there said, right, Chris, you've been working um, in a polytechnic, a teaching led institution for a year. You've got some publications out. Good for you. But you come here, your job is research and then teaching in that order. And he said, for that reason, we will give you six hours teaching in the first year. So I could write the grant applications, chat up industry, do all the things that you get my head around the European Commission, and all that kind of stuff to, to build a research tree. But you find quite often these days, because the character of the job has changed, um, naturally it has when you're taking four times as many undergraduate students. Um, somebody gets a lectureship with no previous experience. They're given 400 hours teaching in the first year. A lot of that will be practicals, but you're never ever... Oh, and they expect them to do some sort of in-house teacher training course as well. Um, so with that kind of load on you from the start, you're never going to get any research going. But that doesn't matter because the character of the job has changed, because the character of what the universities um, actually um, are engaged with has changed, which is largely undergraduate teaching. Now this bothers me tremendously, because we've seen this huge expansion. A third of recent graduates are in unskilled jobs. And this is um, data from the Office for National Statistics. And when they said in, in the previous six years, I thought the Guardian had made a mistake, I thought they made six months. But apparently, the Office for National Statistics, they define a recent graduate as somebody who's graduated in the last uh, six years. So over a third of those uh, were employed in lower skilled occupations. Well, what does that mean? Well, the Office for National Statistics defined people in lower skilled occupations as, well, people working in shops, cleaners, waiters. You see them there. I mean, nothing whatsoever wrong with doing jobs like that, but you seriously need to have worked for three years um, for a degree and to have a debt of £30,000 around your neck. I don't think so. I think a whole generation has been sold, uh, if not a downright lie, I think they've been misled somewhat. So, 14% graduating since 2005, unemployed. So of those who actually did get a job, then almost half are in low-skilled jobs. And it appears to me that too many graduates are being produced uh, for the, the labour market. 
um, which, which is terrible. One in three applications for this year's graduate vacancies from students who graduated last year or the year before. 10 million graduates in the UK, quite a bit actually for a population of uh, 60 million when you think about it, but there's only 9 million graduate level jobs. So there's, there's a mismatch, there's an imbalance. This is interesting. Um, this is a, an article, it's a comparison between how we do things in this country. In other words, these days we tend to try and get everybody through university. And how they tend to do things in, in Switzerland and Germany. Now, I uh, remember some years back working at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. And the guy uh, I normally work with, we needed a, a piece of uh, equipment made. He said, oh, well, I'm a bit busy for the next few days, but I'll lend you my technician. Now, my heart fell slightly, because we tend to think of a technician in this country as somebody who does a fairly routine job. <coughs> we, we, we do, that, that, that's our that, that sort of uh, perception. So this guy came along called Xavier, and to cut a long story short, he can do electronics, he can do computing, he can do mechanical engineering. The man is a star. And it turns out that he hadn't been to university, but they have a very serious um, technical education system. And the Germans are the same. They take it very seriously. So that's the point. And I did think at the time, hmm, I think maybe you're onto something here. Perhaps your system is a, a bit, uh, what shall I say, more open-ended than ours. You, you, you push the people who are academic into the universities, but other people, who are bright and actually want to do hands-on stuff, then there is a very good uh, mechanism uh, to train them to do that. And that doesn't seem like a bad move at all. So, in a nutshell, what went wrong? Why is the university system a shambles? Well, it was overly expanded and too rapidly. No consideration given whatsoever as to what the subjects uh, were being studied. It's bums on seats funding. If you can get the students and you can get the money, that's it. I mean, when the governments, well, let's say governments, because it's various governments that have been involved in all of this, nobody sat down and said, right, okay, the future. How many graduates do we need in chemistry, pharmacy, media, psychology? You know, so you, you get these absurd degrees being taught in some places. And they are absurd because they don't seem to do those who graduate uh, in these subjects much good at the end of it. I mean, why go to university and end up on the dole? I mean, it, it just seems crazy. But the real tragedy is that the polytechnics, which were good institutions, um, they were forced to adopt the trappings of universities, but they didn't really have the traditions, nor, it has to be said, the standards, because their job was something different. You know, it, it, it is the square, heg, square peg in a round hole uh, kind of thing. And the good polys lost their strong vocational role in education, their connection to local industry, and they simply became bad universities. And the bottom two-thirds, practically, of the league table are all ex-polytechnics, whereas once upon a time, um, they would have been very good examples of their own kind of institution. Certainly there's been a lack of proper standards implemented over the uh, academic promotions to professorships and readerships. Universities have become incredibly uh, bureaucratised, but then so has just about every other occupation I can think of from what people would tell me. Everywhere is more bureaucratic now. But you have a strange shift of power. So at one time, say, you would have a departmental secretary. Okay, usually she, and maybe she would have had uh, a couple of assistants if it was a fairly big uh, <coughs> department. But now you don't have a departmental secretary and staff supporting the academics. And they are now the departmental administrative manager. So she's telling the professors what to do. So you've got this huge shift of power throughout universities where the, the support staff um, are sometimes in a, in a position of telling, telling the academics what to do. It, it's, it's quite strange, it's quite strange, because I would think it's the academics who ought to know how to run a university better than managers or other people, but I don't know. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Oh no, no, that's true. I, I could give you some uh, direct and bad examples. Yeah. Remedial action. Uh, professors and readers should reapply for their titles against proper national standards. That would put the cat in my opinion, wouldn't it? And there should be an independent body to validate the quality of such candidates. And if they're not up to it, then something should be done about it. 
Um, to be a science professor, you should be of the sort of standard to be awarded a, a DSC, a high doctorate from a, a proper university with a significant uh, research publication record. Or if you're more focused on the teaching side, then there are journals like the Journal of Chemical Education. You should have some scholarship and innovation, and this is often what's lectured. But we, we need a restructuring of the system overall, with the former polytechnics looking back to where they started, which is what they were actually good at. And this is where I start to come into the idea that what we need are more practically trained people, certainly in the world of Pan, more work-related and practical training. Um, this is good. It, it's a shambles. Um, this is a university up in the northwest. We've seen uh, Mr. Blair. This is Mrs. Blair, who was their chancellor. And it was an external examiner saying all sorts of things about shoddy examination practices. Never mind about that particular university. It could be any number. Um, you hear about financial irregularities, dodgy visas being got for international students. You name it. I mean, I, I look at it and I really wonder what on earth is going uh, on with the system. And I think largely it's a system that's really been stretched and under-resourced. And the cracks start to appear periodically. And you do get these uh, disgraces uh, occurring. Now this is my um, hometown, you might say, Reading. This is a banner outside Reading College. And they're, they're uh, basically uh, shouting about their, their apprenticeships. Fair enough. Um, give your business the edge, and so on. Now, it's an interesting uh, organization. Reading College uh, is a very respected institution, respected college within the town of Reading, but for a while um, it was called Thames Valley University. The reason being that there was a merger between TVU and Reading College. And Reading College had always done the same thing, it just ran under a different name for a while. And it runs apprenticeships with local businesses, and you see that the subjects there, catering, hospitality, travel and tourism, motor vehicles, hair and beauty, plumbing, gas and heating, bricklaying, barbering, horticulture, all good stuff. I don't see that every subject needs to be studied in somewhere called a university. Not at all. So, you know, catering, you get degrees in catering, tourism, hotel management, all the rest of it. I don't see that strictly necessary. And a lot of, I mean, I've got a good friend who was a senior nurse, and she says, I've no idea why on earth nursing was ever made a degree of the subject. It was much better when it was actually trained on the job. And I'm sure she's right. Um, then there are the degrees that don't get jobs. At the moment, media and communications, um, employment is well done. Also, it was done for chemistry uh, because of the uh, contraction of the pharmaceutical sector. But you look at it, you've got a degree in these, these various things with a, a huge debt, probably with the 9,000 a year fees uh, that uh, the, the increase has given. And I do think that many people, rather than going to university, incurring this debt and ending up with a degree that might not do them a hell of a lot of good, would be better doing an apprenticeship, actually. So I'd rather be... Um, trained and in demand as an electrician and an unemployed media studies graduate or an unemployed chemistry graduate. You know, I think that, that we should, like the Swiss and the Germans, take the alternative route of education series as a serious option. Now the government seems to be quite keen on apprenticeships all of a sudden and uh, I seem to remember that uh, this young lady she was being interviewed, she'd not gone to university, she'd done an apprenticeship, and she was very happy as to where her career had gone. She was working for an arms company, actually, but um, she was happy with where it was all going. But Michael Gove is saying that basically we've got to have a uniform and a high standard of apprenticeships so that basically everybody knows what they're getting. And the apprenticeships are not all equal. You get things that last for six weeks that are called apprenticeships. It used to be seven years. Old. You know, so he's saying that we need to have some sort of uniformity and a uniform standard. And yeah, I, I agree. But I think that's a step in the right direction in terms of it. Right. Now, I move on to this next, but uh, I think I've been asked to stop it at more or less this point. Um, the world's world is a changing climate. So the reason I didn't say uh, education and climate change, I need to speak to you more widely about the change in climate. Because, okay, carbon emissions and climate change, that's one thing. Peak oil. Um, we have a global world that runs on the huge 
it's not running out, but it's going to become incredibly expensive anytime soon. We want to be able to keep the global land to the economy running as it is now. Population, 9 billion by 2050. Not so sure about that, um, depending on what there are the resources. There are other analyses that suggest there'll be a peak in population sometime this century. It won't just carry on growing. Um, declining resources of all kinds, water, oil, gas, coal, uranium, metals, phosphorus, uh, all our agriculture depends on uh, rock phosphate, and there is likely to be a problem with the supply of rock phosphate uh, this, this century to uh, run our modern industrialized agriculture. Land degradation, soil erosion. even if we can get past all our problems of energy and everything else, um, the way we're going, we're not going to have enough of the living stuff to grow up in the future. We've degraded something like a quarter of the world's arable land in the last 25 years. It's, it's terrifying. Health, yeah, there's an obesity <coughs> epidemic. Some people think it's too much uh, fructose in the diet, lack of exercise, unemployment, community, lack of nature deficit disorder. You come across that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I rather like that. I, I went to a <coughs> permaculture course uh, a year or so ago, and it, it was uh, mentioned there. And the idea is that um, it, it was referring to all of us, particularly to young people, but because there's a tendency to spend too much time in front of these damn things and not actually go out in, into nature and so forth, that it actually has a bad effect on us psychologically. And there are some really um, impressive results. Uh, people suffering from depression, um, you get people out in nature doing practical things, gardening, and it does have a beneficial effect. I find when I get out and start doing the practical stuff, my stress just disappears. It just sort of transports me. I feel sort of connected, centered somewhere. And it's also being used to treat young offenders, to try and you know, get them, well, back on the even path kind of thing. So I think there's a lot in that. Yeah, people are getting poorer all the time, the price of food is going up, the price of imported fertilizers. This is terrible for about two billion farmers who are on the margins already. Um, it wouldn't take very much in terms of uh, an increase in the price of fertilizers to push them uh, over the, the edge of the knife, basically. Unfair global uh, trade practices, well, that's a, a whole issue in its own right. The global economy is unstable, as we know, we, you, know you look at the FTSE and see it all wobbling away and wonder what on earth's going to happen yet. And there are a lot of us on the planet, and we are using up resources at an incredible rate. And I think we are coming up against the buffers of what is possible. And so I think that we are now seeing the limits of the growth of the global economy. Perhaps we're seeing the, the limits of capitalism. So now we've got to start thinking of doing something different. Seems like a whole lot of different problems, but actually they are connected. And so we can take single courses of action that will address all of these things, because they're all manifestations of a single problem, really. Okay, I'll stop there so everybody can have a cup of tea or whatever. And I've got a few more slides afterwards, and uh, I want to elaborate on this a bit and talk a bit about transition or what I think about it what it means to me, as it were, and uh, really, rather than, than this sort of running off the edge of a cliff with this sort of globalized um, approach, uh, basically capitalism, to maybe a more sustainable grassroots way of approaching these uh, singularities that are confronting us. Right, okay, I'll stop, stop for a bit. Right. Thank you very much.